All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name's Kate, and I'll be here to lead this discussion. I'm just gonna move out slightly. Um, maybe we could start um, with some introductions. Would you like to start, Ekaterina? So, um, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, my name is Ekaterina Malievska. I'm a co-founder and former chief innovation officer of a company called Compass Pathways. Um, the, uh, the company is focusing on accelerating patients' access to innovation, evidence-based innovation in mental health, and the leading program is developing psychedelics for treatment-resistant depression and other conditions of significant unmet need. Thanks, guys. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Cosmo, uh, I'm the CEO of uh, another psychedelic drug development company called Beckley SciTech. Um, it actually has a very similar mission to what Ekaterina just said, so it's, it's developing psychedelics into licensed pharmaceutical medicines to help treat conditions such as treatment-resistant depression and alcohol use disorder, and we're looking at kind of short-duration psychedelics like 5-MeO-DMT. Great. Um, maybe you could both tell us a little bit about how you got started in the field. So I am a physician. I was trained in internal medicine and for many years I was practicing um, completely oblivious to what's actually going on in the mental health uh, care space. I wrote a lot of prescriptions for antidepressants but never really understood what happens to patients when they cross over to purely mental health care space. And when our family became on the receiving end of mental health care, my son developed severe depression and OCD, and I was trying to find help for him. I found it to be probably the most challenging thing I had to do in my professional life, uh, completely against all my expectations. So that led us to think about how to actually bring mental health care to the level of evidence-based practice and efficacy and acceptable side effect profiles um, comparable to traditional medicine, um, mainstream medicine. Uh, but also we were very uh, aware that there hasn't been any meaningful innovation in uh, psychiatry in terms of psych pharmacological treatments and even psychological treatments. Uh, and the treatments are barely effective uh, and the treatments have a ton of side effects. So the, we started the company, it was an involuntary startup. So we kind of didn't have a choice after we've seen the, uh, what's the, uh, you know, the experience that we had. Uh, and we always thought of ourselves as a mental health care company to have, a, to have a little more holistic approach to the development of psychedelics. And we have chosen psychedelics not for necessary for the love of drugs and not with a mission to help society enlightened or let's all take psychedelics. Uh, but actually, as, uh, because the early studies showed such promising signals, signals that haven't been seen in psychiatry uh, at all, if ever, uh, we thought we would explore whether there is a there there, whether we can, you know, take this uh, compounds through regular uh, clinical development and develop it into a medicine that would be available and integrated into the national care guidelines, reimbursed and accessible to everyone. So that was our story. <laughs> Amazing, thank you. Great, yeah, and um, our, our stories kind of overlap and mm -hmm. intertwine to some extent. So. Um, I, I guess my story starts with my mother, who is actually one of the kind of most well-known pioneers of psychedelic science. Um, and she's called Amanda Fielding, and she's been running a non-profit for about 25 years called the Beckley Foundation. And, um, and, and basically the, the focus of that was, it was set up in the 90s when there was a, a real kind of, it was like the dark ages of, of research when it came to psychedelics. and and her mission was to kind of reignite scientific research into psychedelics and how they work in the brain and how they can be used to help people. And uh, because basically she and I think we all felt 
that these drugs were being ignored because of social stigma rather than good scientific reasons. And so Beckley Foundation was one of a very, very small group of, of kind of institutes that were trying to support researchers who, who wanted to look at this area. And so in the 20 or so years, they, they were involved in a lot of the kind of most seminal research. So some of the research that Katerina was just talking about, it, the, in academic settings, so small academic centers like uh, Imperial College and Johns Hopkins and NYU started doing amazing research. And, and so then what happened after that was then suddenly there was enough evidence to say, okay, let's move to the next stage, which is move, take this data out of the kind of academic center and move into a kind of fully fledged drug development program where we can not just do interesting science, but actually make these medicines available, legally available, through the regulatory system as proper mainstream medicine. So that, that's kind of why we set up Beckley SciTech to kind of move to the next chapter and, and compass what Katerina did was started before us. So we've kind of been working in, in similar kind of areas anyway. Mm. Can you tell me a little bit about what have been the most successful um treatments in terms of um, pervasive conditions or drug condition, sorry, drug resistance, uh, mental health conditions? Within psychedelics, mm. So, I mean, well, I mean, should we... Please? The, so, I'd say that the, in terms of regulatory stages, the, the furthest ahead is MDMA for post-traumatic stress disorder. So, that's MDMA in conjunction with psychological support for, um, for treating people with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and, and that's a, a non-profit slash benefit corp have been running it called MAPS. And they've been around for a very, very long time as well. And, and they've completed their phase three. So in clinical development, you know, it goes preclinical. First, you have to show it in preclinical models. Then you go into healthy volunteers. That's phase one. Phase two is showing in, in some patients that it's safe and effective. And then phase three is the large patient population where you show it's safe and effective. And they've completed phase three. Um, and so hopefully are on track to actually get that approved by the FDA within the next year or so, year or two. Um, and then coming up close behind, one, I'll pass over to Katerina, because mm -hmm. really it's what Compass are doing. Well, we will see. It's a, yeah. it's a marathon, right? We'll see how long it will all take. Um, so we have Cell7, uh, the develop, clinical development program, um, uh, COM360, which is a synthetic proprietary synthetic uh, formulation of uh, Cell7 that we finished phase 2B study, uh, a dose finding study, that showed actually for the field of psychiatry remarkable results. Um, in the highest dose that was well tolerated, 37% uh, of people uh, responded or remitted uh, after just one administration, and 29% uh, of them maintained response and remission three months later. So that is uh, a paradigm shift uh, for treatment in psychiatry. Uh, but it's not only just pharmacological effects of it, but it's also uh, incredibly empowering for patients. They, I think the, the, the value that patients see in this approach is that um, uh, they feel uh, that, that there is a sense of agency, there is a sense of self-efficacy that they can separate themselves from the symptoms of depression. And that's, that is a very powerful realization and, and insight that they gain during this treatment. So that's our program. And then, of course, there are a number of other companies that are uh, developing you know, uh, a variety of psychedelics, and Cosmos Company is just one of them, a very interesting compound. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I mean, um, maybe it's worth giving just the context of how um, psych psychedelics are being kind of used as treatment. So I think just to clarify, it's, you know, it's being delivered in conjunction with psychological support. And, and basically the way it works is a, if you're a patient, you'll first kind of meet up with the therapist and get what's called preparation therapy. So it's basically preparing you 
for the experience kind of, and, and preparing you to think about what you're trying to get out of the experience. Then you go to a clinic where the drug is administered while being supervised by the therapists in the room. So it is you know, under close supervision, mm. and then subsequently they're given what's called integration therapy, which is to kind of process the experience and use it for kind of long-term behavioral change, right? So, so that's kind of basically the way the treatments are working, broadly speaking, now, that, uh, broadly speaking. Um, and, and the different compounds can be dropped in there depending on the different indications, the different kind of conditions that are being treated, et cetera. So the, the, condition, the, the drug that we're looking at primarily is a drug called 5-MeO-DMT, which is uh, it, it's interesting because it's known to be very, very potent, but also very short in duration. So drugs like oral MDMA and oral psilocybin and LSD to some extent, they've had by far the most research done on them historically. So they're the most well-characterized drugs. There's the most data on their safety and their efficacy in a range of different drugs. And, and, and you know, certainly I expect MDMA and psilocybin to be the first drugs that become approved. But then there are these other psychedelics like 5-MeO-DMT, which are much less researched so far, but they have some very interesting characteristics. So the idea with 5-MeO-DMT is because it's so short in duration, the hope is that people spend less time in the clinic and therefore potentially it can be kind of a more cost-effective treatment. All of this is to be borne out in the research, so we're, we're earlier stage. But there's, there's a lot to be kind of... There, and there are lots of other interesting compounds and then analogues that are being developed, completely new, unique psychedelic compounds that are being developed as well. Exciting stuff. And how long does the, um, I guess, the benefits last so far in the research? Well, that's a very good question. And I think, that, uh, well, one of the things that we were talking about before is I think there's, there's a bit of a danger with psychedelics where it, they attract sensational headlines, whether it's good or bad, mm -hmm. I think. And, and so there can be a sense, and at the moment we're in a wave of positive news around psychedelics. Obviously, previously there's been a wave of very negative news back in the 60s, etc. Um, and I think there is, there's been some amazing data where you, people have been given a single dose of psychedelics and they've recovered for a whole year or, you know, indefinitely from depression or whatever it is. I think... I think companies like ours are trying to kind of temper expectations. You know, it's not a miracle cure for everyone kind of thing, but it hopefully is effective and durably effective for a, a significant period of time. So I think, well, your, your study you can talk about, but it was, you know, we're seeing results for three, a single dose can have durable effects for three months at least kind of thing, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. I would just say that uh, despite the uh, encouraging results, I would say do not try it at home because um, I think not everyone responds. It is definitely not a miracle drug. And we still don't know who uh, is more likely to respond, who is more likely to respond adversely. And anything that can help you can hurt you. Mm. And so we still... Um, the, the, the way I think the psychedelic industry, if you, or sector, psychedelic sector approaches it, I think is very um, sensible. That we are systematically challenging the assumptions that were made in the 50s and 60s. Do we need to have two therapists? Do we need to have extensive preparation and integration? How much patients really do need? And those are all... Uh, empirical questions that could be answered in the research so we can select and support patients in the best way possible and optimize the outcomes. Mm -hmm. So that, I think, is the, uh, you know, the goal and the future. And so the therapy optimization, I think, you know, maybe that the drugs themselves are not even so innovative, but the therapy optimization research is a cutting edge and the most interesting part of it. And I, I think, right, one of the big questions for the whole field is 
you know, how many doses at what interval are going to be required to not just get someone well, but keep someone well. Because mm. conditions like depression, they're traditionally a chronic depression. So, you know, there are waves of depression that people suffer. And the question is, we're characterizing at the moment what a single dose does and how long it can last. But I think a secondary question, a very important one is, okay, say a single dose can get someone out of their symptoms and get them into remission. How long does that last? Or at what point does that person want a second dose? Is it as they're relapsed? So those are the things that the, the field needs to discover, but that requires a lot more research, basically. Mm, absolutely. And how do you recruit people, and what is the eligibility for that? Well, um, <laughs> there are different ways of recruiting patients for studies. I think patients, patients and psychiatrists and care, healthcare providers are now much more informed about all the research that is going on uh, in psychedelics, um, all the trials that are going on psychedelics, and so. Patients can reach out proactively or they can be referred by a healthcare provider. Uh, and so that requires a lot of education of uh, physicians who would refer a therapist, who would refer patients. But also, um, I think a lot of uh, kind of balanced conversations in the media because patients might, want, might come with unrealistic expectations. You know, those are the patients who, su who are suffering for decades. Um, and nothing works, uh, no available treatments work for them. So they oftentimes see it as a last resort and it, they literally say, I'm here to be cured and it may, may not happen. So uh, I think more balanced conversations about potential of psychedelics is, is really, really important. Mm. And when we talk about mental health, um, we know it's an area that's been traditionally um, short-funded in the public health system particularly. How do you see this, um, I guess, playing out in a more public, inclusive health sector? In mental health in general? Mm. Or particularly psychedelics, yeah. Well, I think psychedelics, uh, it, you know, because they are scheduled substances, mm. um, by definition, the schedule one means that they don't have uh, uh, medical benefits and they have high potential for abuse, none of which is true. And I think the science, the existing evidence now uh, showed very clearly that psychedelics have medical potential. Um, so increasingly government f uh, agencies started funding research in psychedelics. The Swiss government funded uh, research, um, uh, a large study of psilocybin in depression. German uh, government funded the, um, another trial in Germany. And NIMH and NIDA uh, in the US started funding psychedelic research. So there is a little bit of a movement on that. And also MHRA in the UK, uh, not MHRA, NICE, uh, and, uh, and uh, NHR. Uh, started funding psychedelic research. But in general, of course, mental health is such a complex uh, area that uh, it requires really, you know, thoughtful and harmonized approach to uh, funding because there are different parts. It's an ecosystem of, uh, you know, elements that don't have commercial uh, viability that only can be developed as non-profits and then there is uh, there are parts that are clearly businesses, that, like drug development, clinical development. And so all these parts need to work together in harmony. And that is the challenge of the funding. Mm. And may maybe um, just to clarify one of the things that what we're both trying to do in terms of making these drugs available is it's not about drug policy reform. What we're trying to do is take the drugs through the classic pharmaceutical mm. drug development approach. And if you can show that your specific formulation of a specific psychedelic drug, when delivered in a specific way, is not only safe but effective at treating a, a condition like depression, then the regulators like the, MH, uh, like the MHRA in the UK or the FDA in the US, then they basically have to uh, like, agree that that is a prescribable medicine. So there's 
there, there'll be a change of scheduling for that drug, but there's not, it's not a big political mm. drug policy question. It is a kind of scientific medical question that can this drug be prescribed? And once it can be prescribed, then the question is where and how is it prescribed? And I, I think Compass have been doing a lot of work on that as they're kind of close to the market, but I think generally speaking, the expectation is that there will be kind of specialist interventional psychiatry centers, basically, where people go to have psychiatric interventions, whether that's... So there's a drug called Spravato at the moment, which is already out on, on the market. That's uh, esketamine. So it's Johnson & Johnson developed it, and it is a kind of ketamine analog um, that's been approved for treatment-resistant depression. So that's already out there now, and that's actually on track to become a, a quite successful drug for treatment-resistant depression. And so that's kind of laying the, the groundwork for where these drugs can be administered. Again, it has to be delivered under supervision in particular centers with particular training. And I think as more drugs become available, there'll be increasing numbers of these centers and they'll be increasingly kind of spread across the world. And I guess related to that, what does training look like? I mean, I imagine there's a whole group of psychiatrists coming out of training now looking for the future. Well, is this already embedded in training? Uh, medical training, or is it something that will be introduced? How, how will it manifest? Yeah, um, I think in order to do large-scale, late-stage clinical trials, we had to train a lot of therapists, mm. and we had to educate a lot of healthcare providers in what to expect, what patients are suitable, what patients are not suitable. So uh, over the period of six years that our company exists, um, I think we've been in interactions with a lot of uh, healthcare providers and we've trained um, over 300 therapists already. And so all this capacity building in the, in the, in the system will translate into more and more training and more, um, you know, as we gear towards uh, launch post-approval, um, it will still be, uh, you know, we will still continue learning how to train you know, what the best approach is. So it will be an ongoing process, but I think we have the, the basics down. Yeah, and, and I think, exa exactly, at the moment, again, this is one of the interesting things for the industry. I think if we look into the future, I think we expect this to be a class, a new class of medicine for mental health, and there'll be multiple compounds that will be available. And at the moment, each company is having to train therapists specifically to their compound to be able to deliver yeah. their compound for them, which is, in, when you look into the future, that is not very efficient. So there are multiple therapists who have had to gone through our training, as well as Compass's training, as well as MAPS for MDMA training, which is a lot of training and there's a lot of overlap. So, you know, in the future, hopefully there will be some more well. kind of standardized system which makes it kind of easier to train the scale and number of people that we, we need to train. And a question I didn't ask earlier, I know you mentioned um, nasal sprays in both of your trials. How are you administering the um, treatment? So, well, ours is, ours is intranasal. Mm. Um, so it, it, the drug that we've developed, 5-MeO-DMT, is actually, if you take it orally, it's not kind of bioavailable. So it needs to be delivered, but kind of it needs to avoid the first pass metabolism. And so intranasal is a kind of well-established route of administration for, for um, delivering those kinds of drugs. So we're, yeah, we're delivering it intranasally, but I think psilocybin we, is um, We formulated it as a capsule. So patients take a capsule um, and you know, that day of administration looks like the patients come into the clinic uh, go into the non-clinical, the room that we, you know, turn into sort of non-clinical environment, non-stimulating, various soothing colors, um, and patients take the capsule uh, and lie down on the couch, put on the eye shades, and listen to a specially designed uh, music playlist that sort of follows the pharmacokinetic of the drug. Um, and that experience lasts about, uh, about four to six hours, and the therapist is always with the patient in the room to support if anything, if patient needs anything. Um, but that's, that's an oral formulation, and that's how the experience looks like. And that's 
what Ekaterina is saying there is also, I think, important for, for kind of psychedelics like psilocybin and 5-MeO-DMT. I think th th it, what people sometimes don't understand is they think, oh, you're in a room with a therapist for the whole duration of that psychedelic experience. Are you just kind of chat, having a therapy session, a kind of talk therapy session? And, and generally speaking, certainly with both of our drugs, actually what the patient is prepared and encouraged to do is to actually kind of close their eyes and kind of look introspectively and go through their own personal experience. It's not a kind of psychotherapy chat. Um, the, the, the therapist in the room is there to make them feel safe and make them feel, if they do need support, make them feel safe and make them feel comfortable going back into the experience and kind of surrendering to the experience rather than having a big chat, if you see what I mean. Okay. And let's talk a little bit about the future. I mean, I know with um, healthcare in general, there's a lot more of a trend towards um, digital, um, digital first, telemedicine, things like that, uh, remote settings. Do you see any of these things playing into the psychedelic therapies? Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, there are a lot of questions about scalability of the treatments mm. because it's, uh, you know, it's, six to eight hours of the session plus preparation and integration, how can we um, make it more scalable without sacrificing safety and potentially even optimizing the outcomes? So all this research is ongoing. We are uh, looking at, uh, for example, uh, the predictor, we're looking at large language models. We're using large language models to analyze patients' narratives before, during, and after to understand the potential predictors of adverse events or potential predictors of uh, better clinical outcomes. We're also learning how to support patients better based on the, um, uh, what they've identified in preparation. So, in, um, and, and make that more efficient and increasing patient safety. So, there are many technological sort of add-ons that we could um, deploy together with psychedelics. Yeah, and I mean, I completely agree. And I think digital's, I, I think we both agree digital's going to play a really important role in making these medicines as scalable and affordable as possible. And I, I think that there are a number of ways that they can play a part, like Katarina was saying. Firstly, I mean, the dream scenario is to be able to identify which people are going to respond and not respond kind of predictively so that you can maximize the efficiency of the treatment firstly so you kind of select the people who are going to respond best in addition there's the kind of the easier thing is at least providing digital tools to help prepare patients and support patients afterwards and i think if you the way psychedelics seem to work is there's this kind of you know uh psychological experience and there's also a kind of physiological underpinning where we've seen in the brain that there's this kind of neuroplasticity so there's synaptogenesis there's new neurons being uh, there's a lot going on in the brain anyway where there's and it creates this window of neuroplasticity which basically allows people to change their behavior in the long term and that this window is a potentially an amazing opportunity for digital interventions to come in and actually be more effective than if they were just being given to someone who hadn't had a psychedelic treatment. So there's a lot of potential synergy between the kind of digital therapeutics and the kind of pharmacotherapy of psychedelics. And there is also, I think, one caveat with psychedelics. This is not everyday medication. This is one-off. And then there is a period of time when patients maintain response or remission. But at some point, some of them will start deteriorating. And if we can follow this patient's perspectively and understand when they start sliding back into depression and treat them more preventatively, yes. avoiding that sort of ups and downs that predict the um, undesirable course of depression, that would, you know, digital phenotyping would be super helpful in managing these patients. Great. I think we've um, done all we can do today time-wise, although I think we could have spoken for another hour, frankly. Such a great topic. Probably. Thank you so much for joining Thank me. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Look at that. I know.